Hey, I'm Veronica from Uexpressure. Let me briefly introduce you to what we at Uexpressure do. Uexpressure is an online platform where you can build customer journey maps, impact maps and personas for your organization. With more than 100 ready-to-use templates, you can speed up your persona creation and mapping processes. To help you build confidence on your journey and learn from other practitioners, we host community events on user, customer, employee experience and all things journey mapping. Our speakers are industry experts that are willing to share their knowledge to help you design and build better products and services. We also speak at the events ourselves and share tips and tricks we learned through years of practice and numerous interviews with other mappers. On top of that, we have your Expression Academy where you can dive into learning how to build journey maps, personas and conduct interviews. And do that all at your own pace. Don't forget to check it out and enjoy the event. So uh, what I'd like to uh, talk to you about today is why you should be thinking about doing journey mapping now and also why you should be considering doing it in teams and certainly not alone. So I'd like you to think uh, about how customer journey is affected by outside factors. So, you know, we all remember the uh, COVID uh, pandemic. I mean, you know, COVID's not, not, not disappeared, but uh, it's certainly not as bad as it was two years ago. Uh, and that affected us all, uh, our way of life, immensely. So I'd like you to think about what your expectations of businesses were during the COVID pandemic given the restrictions that were in place or lockdowns, store closures, restricted mobility, et cetera. Did businesses meet your expectations? If not, why didn't they? Uh, did you notice a difference in the application of technology in, in business? And did you notice some businesses adapting quicker and, and better than others? Uh, and, I, and I'd like to give you a, a couple of examples of uh, things that I noticed, that I witnessed, which showed the differences in, in how companies reacted. So uh, when, when the lockdowns uh, started taking place, it was spring of, uh, of 2020, and that was you know high season for garden centers and, and, and people who like to do things in the garden. And obviously, garden centers uh, were not considered to be essential uh, items of daily use. And so they had to close down. They weren't allowed to uh, accept uh, customers into, into, their, into their premises. So uh, this was very frustrating for, for a lot of people who like to do stuff in the garden. And of course, this wasn't restricted. Uh, so how to get hold of your uh, the things that you needed, like plants, like uh, fertilizer, or like soil to, to work in your garden. So we had two garden centers that were near us. And one garden center put in place uh, an appointment system. So they would only accept one customer in the store uh, at one time, and you had to call up and you had to make an appointment. And these appointments um, were exhausted very quickly. So you rang to make an appointment. They said, yes, you can come in three weeks' time. And obviously, that was very frustrating and, and not really satisfactory. And then there was another garden center not too far away. And they set up a system where you called. You told them what you needed. You said when you could come and pick it up. And they sent you an email to uh, uh, they sent you an email to uh, giving you uh, a time slot, confirming a time slot, and confirming your order. And then you basically you went and picked it up in the parking lot of that uh, of that store. And it was on a pallet. You picked it up, you loaded it in the car. And the invoice uh, for payment was on was on top of the pallet with the goods, and this meant that they were actually able to handle a lot more customers in uh, in one day than the other garden centre. And this was, of course, a really uh, good example of how a business was able to pivot 
and that's the name, the, the, the word that we used for it at the time, uh, quickly and adapt to, uh, to the situation. Uh, one other example I can give you was, was for electronics. Uh, so there's a, a big uh, electronics chain here. Also, electronics weren't considered uh, to be essential items of day-to-day -day use. And uh, one of the electronics store, they already had an online store, but they realized that they had a lot of inventory in, uh, in their stores also that, that, were, that were closed. Uh, and sometimes the inventory in the stores uh, was still available, whereas online it was no longer available. So they would they started to show the inventory online in the various stores, and you could call up the store, uh, order uh, an article, and they would ship it to you by mail, uh, with free shipping, uh, and uh, very quickly. And so basically, they were continuing to use their staff in the store, who were going around the store, picking out these uh, these. Uh, articles, these products that were being ordered uh, over the telephone and then shipping them out to customers. So this again was an example of, uh, of a store that reacted really quickly to the, uh, the situation. But the fact is, you know, if, if we look at the, uh, the world today, it's, it's in constant flux. Right. If you look at these headlines uh, that are on the slide, so we've got, you know, high inflation, we've got energy shortages, we've got uh, armed conflict in, in Ukraine. Everybody is trying to cope uh, with, uh, with this situation. And it, it's not restricted to one country, but it's a global issue. And various countries are being affected more or less by the situation as it evolves. And you see, it's not just one thing. So we started off with COVID and that wasn't that long ago. Uh, and then now we're at the, the cost of living. Uh, there's the armed conflict uh, in Ukraine, which is, is creating uh, various uh, shortages and also contributing to the uh, increase of, of costs. And then we have to ask ourselves, okay, what's going to be next? Because there's always something around the corner which is going to affect the markets, either negatively or positively. And as the Institute of Customer Service in the UK pointed out uh, not that long ago, a year ago, the Institute warned that customers were fed up with companies using COVID as an excuse for long waits on the telephone or late deliveries. But that issue has now clearly been overtaken by issues related to the cost of living. So we see how, and, and a lot of companies still use COVID and, and, and uh, lack of resources as an excuse for long waits on the telephone or late deliveries. But we can see that uh, as time goes on, as the situation changes, that isn't necessarily something which is bothering people as much as it used to, because there are other issues that are bothering people far more that are affecting them uh, more significantly. So people are spending less money, but the question is, are they spending it with you? So we have global inflation, uh, which is increasing. Uh, pay raises are unable to keep pace with inflation. So um, the, the five euro bill that you had uh, maybe a year ago is now perhaps only worth three euros, from what you can buy. People have less money to spend. Right as as inflation increases, as uh, costs increase, as um, pay increases are uh, unable to keep pace. So the cost of your groceries uh, increases, uh, your cost of your your heating and your energy increases, and it means that at the end of the month you have less money that is left in your wallet. And so customers are asking themselves, okay, how am I going to spend my money, and where do I spend it? Right, they've got expenses for the car, credit cards, household expenses, various bills, utilities, medical expenses, rent, mortgages. All of this is increasing and people only have um, so much money. So they have to decide, you know, where am I gonna spend that money? How am I gonna spend it? And the question is, are they spending it with you? 
Business is dynamic and, and, and so is the uh, marketplace conditions. So what makes a customer decide to continue to do business with you rather than with somebody else? So uh, the same Institute of Customer Service said that six in 10 consumers say low prices will become more influential when choosing where to shop and what to buy in the next two years. Of course, if you've got less money in your wallet, as we just said, it's, um, it's going to be important to decide how you're going to spend this money and you want to get value for money. But still about a third of those who were asked were still prepared to make more to guarantee good service. So people were still prepared to pay a bit more money uh, if they thought that they were going to get good service or a good product. Uh, so they were still looking for value for money, even if they were going to be more cautious about how they spend it. And Shep Heiken, who I'm sure uh, a lot of you know, in his ACA study in 2021, uh, did a survey to find out uh, how much more people would be willing to spend uh, in, in order to, uh, to get good service. And it showed that uh, just under half uh, of people that he asked would be willing to pay more for, uh, for, for good service. And in some cases, uh, between 8 and 10% were even prepared to pay up to 30% more for excellent service. But uh, at the lower end, between 25 and 30% uh, would be prepared to pay between 1% to 10% more in order to ensure that they were getting good service. So that's something that uh, should, be, should be borne in mind. It's not just the price of the product or the service that counts, but it's also the service that goes along with it. Customers' buying habits have changed also. Uh, so McKinsey wrote an article entitled The Evolving Customer, How COVID-19 is Changing the Way We Shop. So they found, first of all, uh, that more people were using digital. So more people were, were using online uh, methods to or apps to, uh, to do their business. There was a shift to value. So people were looking to get a better value for money. There was a shock to loyalty. So people were less likely to stay loyal to brands if they felt that they could get uh, a, a better deal elsewhere. So this was also giving a, a whole new perspective, if you like, to, to the value of promoters. Uh, and this would have been excellent if we come to the net promoter system. So uh, a good way to check and just see, you know, how solid your promoters are if uh, they're also willing to uh, leave you as a customer uh, to get a better deal elsewhere. Then also they notice what they call the home body economy. So people were looking at spending a lot more time and money at home rather than going out. So uh, eating at home more than, uh, than maybe going out to restaurants, spending more time at home uh, rather than going on vacation, uh, these kind of things. And then also then the new holiday outlook so um, when it came to, to holidays like Christmas time or, or perhaps Thanksgiving in, in, in North America, uh, being more cautious and, and, and more circumspect about how they were spending money, uh, you know, when it came to gifts and organizing parties and, and, and things like that. So, if you haven't already adapted, you need to change gear, right? And Warren Buffett said, in the business world, the rearview mirror is always clearer than the windshield. Yes, that's clear. You know, they say 2020, hindsight vision is 2020. So, you can always look back and see what mistakes you made. Uh, and while it's important to learn from the mistakes that you might have made in the past, it's also really important to look forward and see 
where's the world going? Where's business going? Uh, and what does that mean for me, for our company? And what measures do I need to take in order to, to adapt? And, and that's always a little bit of a risk because you, uh, you know, none of us have a crystal ball. We don't know exactly what's going to happen in the future. But that's why it's important to keep up to date with what's going on in the world, what's going on in the economy. But more importantly, to keep up to date with your customers, uh, keep in touch with them, keep your finger on the pulse uh, and know what are the kind of things which are of concern to them. So when we're doing change, when we're looking at change, there are three really important things to look at. One is what the current status is and to look at what has changed. Then to set yourself a short-term goal to adapt to the change quickly. Uh, and then to look at a medium-term goal and say, okay, what are the medium-term trends? What do I have to do to, uh, to add to that and to do uh, a SWOT analysis? Uh, and for those of you who might not know what a SWOT analysis is, it is to look at your strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats over the, uh, the, the time frame that you're analyzing. And, and it's important to use, you know, voice of the customer, customer feedback, and data analysis to look at how the market's changing, how your customer's behavior is changing, how your customer preferences are changing in order to, to do this planning. So the most important questions that you need to be asking yourself are, have my customers' needs, wants, and motivations changed? If yes, how? So what is my customer's purpose? What is the customer trying to achieve uh, when they interact with, uh, with our company? And have the customer touch points and the channels that my customers want to use changed? And if yes, how? The customer purpose is a key element in effecting change. So I'm going to refer here to the Harvard Business Review uh, for the definition of what a customer purpose is. So the customer purposes are all the intents, needs, questions, or desired outcomes that might compel a customer to engage your company. Think anything that starts with something like, I need, I want, how can I, or can you? These many needs are what make up your customer purpose portfolio. And every purpose in your customer purpose portfolio is the end point of a modern customer journey. Every purpose is the thing around which every uh, an experience is designed. Every purpose reflects an outcome that every time it's achieved by a customer generates value for your business. So the customer purpose is really what you need to consider when you're looking at your uh, customer journey. And it's really important to align your business strategy and the customer purpose, right? So, so as the world business and markets change, it's critical to ensure that the customer purpose portfolio and your business strategy uh, remain aligned, right? Uh, it, it's no point uh, you offering um, things to your customers which are not part of your business strategy. That's then going to be detrimental to, to your business. So you have to look at your customer purpose portfolio and see where it aligns with your business strategy in order to uh, ensure uh, the alignment then happens when you're doing your customer journey map, because the customer journey map will help you ensure that this alignment is optimized to create maximum value for both your company and your customers. And that's really critical uh, because business ultimately has to be a win-win situation. The business has to uh, make a living from it and the customer has to be satisfied uh, and achieve the purpose uh, that we were talking about. So when you come to, to do your journey mapping workshop and uh, 
you have to decide uh, how you're going to do it. The first thing is that customer journey mapping is not a one person job. Right. If you uh, you have experience, you know, calling call centers or calling companies and discussing a problem, how often are you handed off to another department and you're asked to uh, repeat the issue, repeat the problem? And this is something which causes uh, maximum frustration uh, to customers. And it's just a perfect example of how there are disconnects at the various stage handoffs in a customer journey. And this is something that a customer journey is really intended to, uh, to avoid. And you can't do that if you're doing a, a customer journey map by yourself uh, in, in, in a vacuum. Uh, you can't do that because in order to avoid these handoffs, you need to be able to collaborate and align with other departments that are also part of the customer journey. So basically you're going from is state where you see these various disconnects uh, to ideally to a target state where you see it's a smooth journey for the customer and the handoffs from one department or from one stage to another are uh, unnoticed by the customer. Another thing is breaking down the silos. So effective customer journey maps aren't the responsibility of one department alone. Those responsible for driving the journey mapping exercise need to involve stakeholders and experts from the appropriate departments in the process. But which departments you're going to involve will depend on your company's structure and the map that you're working on, right? And as I said before, it won't be possible to smoothen those handoffs without involving all the various stakeholders that are involved. So who would you involve? Well, you can look at the departments directly implicated in the journey, such as, for instance, customer service, marketing, sales, product design, product marketing, invoicing, collections, for instance. But also think of support functions that may only be indirectly involved, but could nevertheless impact the process. So, uh, for instance, quality management or, uh, or HR. And it's not always obvious which support functions should, uh, should, be, uh, should be involved, but you have to really think uh, along the journey, along the touch points and say, okay, where are support functions involved? And I'll give you an example uh, that I experienced, which, was, uh, which showed just what an effect support functions can have on, on a customer journey, on the customer experience. And that was several years ago, I was involved in a project which uh, required um, a commissioning team of five engineers to travel to a country in uh, Central America. And these five engineers needed uh, visas uh, in order to go to that country. And HR was responsible for uh, obtaining the visas, and they were a little bit slow uh, to get this done. And it meant that the engineers weren't able to arrive um, on site uh, as scheduled. It had to be put back by two weeks until the visas were available. And this meant that the uh, customer uh, got their um, their plant commissioned uh, two weeks later than planned. So that is a, an excellent example of how a support function can affect the customer experience. And then of course, the next thing is a customer. You really want to involve the customer in your, in your journey mapping exercise. And, and I hear some of you say, how, how can we possibly involve the customer? Well, you can involve the customer in, uh, in several ways. First of all, validation sections, select, validation sessions for selected customers. Uh, you can do this for the is 
for the the current status so you can get customers together and and, and or speak to customers and say okay uh this is how we see the journey map let's go through it together is that what actually happens and you can also look at it when you've got your um to be state the target state uh mapped out you can go to customers and say you know how does this seem to you does this seem uh feasible or do you see any issues here Another way you can involve customers is in focus groups. So getting selected customers together uh, to discuss various aspects of the the customer journey and and uh, take on board what they tell you there. Then, of course, there's customer feedback from various touch points. So if you're doing transactional surveys uh, at various points along your current uh, journey, uh, preferably moments of truth, uh, then that will also give you important information for your uh, for your customer journey mapping exercise. And then finally, customer interviews. And if you're in B two B, customer interviews are something which is is very easy to do, and it gives you extremely valuable information. Uh, I'm currently working on a project where we're doing customer in- interviews, uh, discussing the the customer journey map, and the feedback that we're getting from 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 customers uh, in these interviews is extremely valuable. And by virtue of the fact that it's actually coming directly from the customer's mouth, uh, it has that added. Uh, element of of credibility because these are real customers who are telling you exactly what they think face to face uh, and and those uh, uh, that contribution generally is extremely powerful. So those are various different ways uh, of how you can involve customers. I'm sure there are other ways too. Uh, these are just uh, some examples, but uh, be creative. And, and you, I think you'll find that most customers value uh, being given the opportunity to give their input and to participate in in sessions like this, which ultimately are for their benefit, uh, because at the end of the day, it's going to improve their customer experience. What else do I need? Uh, well, you have to decide on your uh, your workshop format. What's it going to be? Is it going to be physical or is it going to be virtual? Um, what tool are you going to use? Oh, there's a typo there. So from post-its on a wall uh, to sophisticated software. So like uh, UX Pressure, for instance, uh, that is a tool which is uh, very good for um, collaborative uh, journey mapping. You have to have a clear scope and definition of the journey to be mapped. And here again, uh, make sure that your the scope is is quite clear. And one word of advice is don't overreach. Uh, don't try to bite off more than you can chew, but make sure that it's a very clear scope. And um, better to start small uh, if you're if you're new to journey mapping than to try and do something big bang uh, to, to, to make a huge big impression. Uh, generally, that gets bogged down. So, rather to start smaller uh, at the beginning than do something that's too ambitious. As I said, also you, you'll need again the customer data from the touch points along the customer journey, whether it's in the um, in data format or whether it's uh, the result of customer interviews. And the moderator, you need someone to pull things together and keep things on track. And that moderator can be either internal or external. What's the difference between an internal or an external moderator when it comes to a customer journey mapping workshop? An internal moderator is going to know the company processes and stakeholders, uh, but maybe unable to take an unbiased view. They might already have preconceived ideas and that make it might make it a little bit difficult for them sometimes uh, to, to to be completely impartial. Uh, and there might be you know baggage and history and 
uh, with other people, other members of the workshop. So that might might possibly be uh, a disadvantage. An external moderator may need more time to understand the product, the service, and who's involved. Uh, but an external moderator will be able to take a less biased view, uh, have no prior history with the participants, uh, be in a position to ask difficult questions uh, from an outside perspective, and will probably have less difficulty in taking a customer perspective uh, when it comes to putting together the journey map. So uh, if you were to ask me what my preference would be, my preference would be to use an external moderator to come in uh, and help with the workshop, but it's not an absolute. So six functions of the customer journey maps are to record what the journey is today. Uh, it's an assessment of the scope of the journey map that you're looking at. It's an indicator of the quality of, of the customer experience. It's a place to capture and hold ideas. And it's a method to prioritize improvements. So you can, you can put together a criteria of say, okay, what uh, are the priorities when it comes to uh, improving our customer experience? And that could be something as simple as uh, an impact matrix. So on one hand, you have the benefit to the customer. And on the other axis, you have the, the, the business value, but also taking into account the uh, resources and the effort that would it take to, uh, to implement those, uh, those changes. Uh, based on that matrix, then you can prioritize which initiatives you want to, uh, to implement first. And then finally, it's a communication tool. So it's a way to um, publicize uh, across the organization what the journey map should look like from, uh, from a customer point of view, how you want, what the experience is that you want or you intend your customers to have when they interact with your company in that particular scope uh, of, of interaction. The important thing when you're designing the experience is always to put the customers at the center of the design process. So always think about you know, the, the customer uh, when you're designing the, the journey map. Establish the customer goals and frame the challenge correctly. So here again, we're coming back to the customer purpose. What is it that the customer is trying to achieve when they interact uh, with the company? And here again, working in a team, uh, working with, uh, with other stakeholders is going to allow you to ascertain that a lot easy, more easily than if you were doing it by yourself in a vacuum. Be clear on how you're going to create value for the business also by helping customers meet a need or solve a problem. So as I said before, it's really important to align the customer goals and, and the company's business vision, business strategy. As we said, involve people from different disciplines uh, across the business. And then design the inside to match the outside. Bear in mind that once you put together the journey map, you have to also to put in place a process which will uh, align with this journey map. And in order to do that, you've got to be able to have the data, uh, the skills and the systems that staff are going to need to deliver the journey. So bear that in mind when you're doing the map. Uh, if it's short term, uh, then you have to make sure that those things are available. If you're looking more long term, medium and long term, uh, if you need to acquire uh, various systems or, or skills, then you're going to have to consider, you know, what the investment in these resources is going to be. And then design and iterate again and again until you get it right. So 
we don't always get things right first time. So once we put something in place, it's important to listen to the customer feedback. And if something needs to be tweaked, something needs to be adjusted, then we have to be able to go back and adjust that and uh, tweak the system to make sure that we do get the, the journey and the experience right. So when you're creating the journey map, decide what to measure. Create your customer persona based on the customer purpose. Define your customer journey faces and plot your touch points. Those are going to be the really important parts of, uh, of creating your, your customer journey map. And it's not my intention here to, uh, to go into a lesson of, of journey mapping, but I'm just telling you these are the main things that you need to, to consider. What's really important is to add the customer thoughts, actions, and emotions. So you really have to ensure that in your in your journey map, you're recording what the customers are prompted to think, do, or feel when you they are at specific touch points along the journey. And note your opportunities. So based on your goals, the customer's goals, and what you discover when you're looking through your journey map, look at the opportunities that are offered by each touch point or within each phase to improve the customer experience. And as we discussed before with the prioritization, decide what changes to make. And what's really important is to make someone responsible and to agree on a deadline for the execution. So if you don't make someone responsible, if you don't have an action owner, uh, somebody who's accountable, then more often than not, you'll find that the action uh, tends to drop by the wayside and doesn't get done. So it's important to make someone responsible, make someone accountable, and to agree on a deadline for the execution, or at least a deadline for an update on progress. Remember that there's no single correct way to design your customer journey map, right? So don't hesitate to be creative. If you respect the basic, or pr basic principles of, of what a map should be, don't hesitate to, uh, to be creative. I mean, we look, it, it can be done in a simple spreadsheet or it can be something that is more intricately designed uh, with touch points and emotions that are illustrated. And uh, you can, as I said, go from just an Excel spreadsheet to using a tool like Uexpressure or some of the other tools that are out there on the market. But this isn't something that should restrict you. Sustainability. This is really important when you're making the change. Uh, and, and this is a story that I love. Uh, the story about four people named everybody, somebody, anybody, and nobody. Things often fail because of a lack of accountability, a lack of ownership, a lack of responsibility, and because people end up uh, pointing the finger and assigning blame. So one of the, the most important uh, parts of um, a customer journey map when it comes to uh, new initiatives is to put together a RACI chart. So which stands for R for responsible. So who's responsible? A, who's accountable? Uh, C for consulted. So who needs to be consulted uh, and, and asked for their opinion? And finally, I inform. So who needs to be kept up to date uh, with progress? And, and a RACI chart is something that's fairly simple, but it gives you uh, clarity as to who's responsible and who has to do what. And in most cases, that will ensure that your project or initiatives actually get carried out uh, rather than them uh, just uh, dropping between, falling between the cracks and getting forgotten. In striving for excellence, keep the basics in mind. So always try and make sure that things are simple. So ease, speed, and reliability are really important uh, things to bear in mind. 
as I said before, plan, do, check, act, review. So if things go wrong, uh, don't hesitate to review them and to restart the cycle. Uh, I, I'm not going to go into this in, in detail. This is the design thinking process, but is really uh, a great use when it comes to doing journey maps. The whole idea of how to put together the experience and uh, the idea of uh, returning once you test it and you find that things aren't work to go back to the ideate um, stage and come up with new ideas to uh, to fit the bill. And this is just in a little bit more detail. Some of the errors. Um, so main pitfall and errors. One person being told to create the map. It's not enough. You have to do it in a, in a team. And uh, this, uh, this is a great opportunity to remind you that on the 3rd of November, uh, you express are organizing a great session about journey mapping in teams. So don't hesitate to sign up for that session also. I'm sure it's going to be absolutely great. Uh, another uh, problem is too few resources. So people don't have the time uh, or departments resist uh, taking part. And that's very often a result of the exercise not being given a high enough priority by senior management. So that's another thing uh, which is really important. Insufficient customer involvement uh, or customer data. People forgetting the customer perspective and taking an inside out perspective rather than uh, looking at it from the customer's point of view. And that is confusing a process with a journey map. Process is, custom, is company intern. A journey map should be looked at from the customer perspective. Another thing which happens very often is that people do a journey map uh they admire it uh they think what a great job they've done and then they put it in a folder or they put it in a cupboard and they don't look at it again that's that's a waste of time complete waste of time not reviewing or updating the map at regular intervals or when the business or market changes that's why it's so important now with the current environment to go back and look at your journey maps uh, and to adjust them now the market's changing rapidly Make sure that your journey maps are up to date uh, and, and you're actually meeting, they're in line with uh, current market conditions. Sometimes the journey doesn't start early enough. First interactions with customers in the awareness stage are missing. So very often we forget that as soon as the customer becomes aware of a need, they're looking for a solution. And this is really the first point of contact with the company. How do you make your customers aware that you're there to resolve this need. So that's important to, to consider. Don't start off by being too ambitious, uh, trying to bite off more than one can chew. Uh, what I posted there, those are an example of a project that I was involved in. And that's not a journey map. That was just an exercise that was done internally to figure out where the customer touch points were and uh, at the end of this exercise, we all looked at what we put on the wall and we said, this is too difficult, we can't do it. And we had to go back and, and break the whole exercise down into much smaller uh, segments. So don't start off by being too ambitious. Sometimes less is more. I'd like to uh, recommend some uh, some literature when it comes to uh, customer journey mapping. All these things are available uh, as Kindle books on Amazon. Uh, Annette France, uh, Jim Kalbach, Alex Allwood. And as you've signed up for this session, you'll be getting my slides uh, as a PDF. So you'll be able to look at these afterwards. Uh, Jeff Sheehan, the Customer Experience Management Field Manual. Jennifer Kleinerham's CX That Sings, also an excellent publication when it comes to journey mapping. And here are some CX people that are worth following also when it comes to, uh, to journey mapping and other CX uh, related topics. And now I'm open to, uh, to your questions. 
Thank you, Michael. Thank you for this talk. There is a first question for you. Sure. Uh, you mentioned one pitfall we come across a lot. When yeah. people build CGMs, customer journey maps, and then right. not do anything about them once they're built. Do you right. have any tips of, on overcoming this, uh, how to get the team back together and turn it into some actionable asset? Well, I think, I think that's the whole thing about, uh, you know, the sustainability, the RACI chart. So you have to agree within the team uh, to start with. I think you have to agree on what actions need to be taken in order to improve the journey, right? And if you have people who are responsible, if you make people accountable for these actions, uh, then that's a great excuse to to get together at regular intervals uh, for an update. Where are we? You know, how how is this process coming along? Um, you, you could you can actually do uh, like a, a template uh, for this, where people update you know the, the the progress, and they can also say what their problems are, whether things are working well or whether they're having an issue with resources or with support. So this is something that can, that can be discussed within the team. And one other thing that I think is important is to try and get an executive sponsor. So try and get somebody who is higher up in the organization, one of the senior managers, to, to sponsor the whole exercise. Uh, so that will give the exercise credibility and it will also uh, allow you to probably, you know, take the resources um, when it comes to uh, these these improvement initiatives to make sure that you know no managers in the organization is then saying no this is important forget it you know we're not going to do this right it, and this is why it's important to try and uh, get senior management backing but also to involve all the stakeholders uh, along the customer journey also at a management level uh, so that they can see what's being done they buy into it Thank you, Michael. And we have one more question. Uh, how, in your opinion, does one need to review? Uh, I'm sorry, how often, in your opinion, does one need to review and update the map? Look, I, I think it depends, you know, very much on on, on the market changes, as, as we've seen. And you saw, you know, at the beginning of my slides, over the past two years, things have changed incredibly quickly. Right. So so you're going to have to adapt to those changes in the market uh, also very quickly. So your journey mapping team might actually be meeting more often than the normal in a stable market where nothing's really changing that much. You could maybe get together once a year just to look at it and see, you know, just to confirm that everything's still working. But in, in, in the kind of markets we're going through at the moment, you probably need to get together more often. And, uh, and and see you know how the the change in the markets uh, and and in the household economics and also business economics are affecting your um, uh, your your customers' experience and your journey map. Thank you so much. And we have a question from Lydia. Uh, she uh, she says that she doesn't really know when to use a service blueprint map or a customer journey because the service blueprint is more uh, more focuses on how the service is delivered in the enterprise and the other one on the customer but how do you choose yeah i, th I think you need the journey map first you need the journey map first to say okay what is the uh, you know what is the what do we want the customer experience to be and then you adapt your service blueprint to the journey map Right. This is what I was talking about earlier on. You have to bear in mind when you're doing the journey map of what resources you're going to need then afterwards to put your service blueprint in, 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 into practice. So you have to uh, you, you, you have to adapt. So the journey map comes first and the service blueprint comes next. Thank you, uh, Lydia. Does it answer your question? I believe yes. <laughs> Uh, according to your message in the chat. So, okay, and we have a question from Tim. Uh, what do you think about data-driven uh, customer journey map, like with the help of 
with the help of market research to identify the central touch points? And what do you recommend to get customer insights on their use touch points when budget is low? Okay, first of all, I, 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 th I think that data is really important, right? Data is, is, is the key, right? So, so I absolutely think that using data uh, to, to drive the customer journey map is uh, is important but i think nevertheless i think you should go back to customers and and find out whether the data actually to confirm what the data is telling you right data is great but don't let data be an excuse not to talk to the customer right the 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 one-on-one -on -one contact with customers is still really really important uh, and the, the second part of the question, if I, if I remember rightly, was, you know, how to get these customer insights if you've got a low budget. Um, you know, talking to customers doesn't actually cost anything. So if you're in, let's say, a B2B uh, environment and you have some key customers, uh, make an appointment for the, to, to talk to them for an hour, get their insights and, uh, and see what they, uh, what they think. And if you're in B two C, uh, then perhaps either do it through th through surveys, or perhaps if you've got physical locations like stores, talk to customers that are coming into your stores and and, and find out, you know, what their impressions are and 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 how uh, how they feel. These are things that really aren't that expensive. You've also got. Um, survey tools uh, that if, if you have got a budget to use someone like uh, Medallia or Qualtrics, you know, that are really the Rolls Royce of uh, customer insight tools, then, then you can go for uh, a tool like Survey Sensum, for instance, uh, or, or Survey Monkey, you know, these things that are really very, very reasonable to also get, uh, get customer insights. There's really no excuse for not doing it. You know, the, the tools are available, they're not expensive. And even if you if you want to do it on a on a face-to-face -face basis, that's even cheaper. Thank you, Michael. I believe uh, Tim let us know if you got the answer. Uh, and we have time for just yes, Tim got thank you. Uh, and uh, we have time for just one question. Uh, and this is a question from Pranav. Uh, should we map entire customer journey around the customer purpose or just wherever it intersects with the offering by the company? Uh, okay, I'm not sure I quite understand that question because, you know, if, if you're, you're, you're doing the journey uh, within, you know, the interactions with your company anyway. Right, so so basically, the journey map should, should should be surrounding your company, but but the important thing to do is, as I said, you know, during my presentation, consider where that journey starts, and the journey should start at the moment that the customer becomes aware that they have a need, right, and at that point, they might not be talking to you directly, but what you really need to focus on is how do I make my customer aware that I'm available to solve that need, right? So it could be through marketing, through advertising, uh, internet presence, uh, social media presence. Uh, so, so really it's important to try and uh, make the customer aware of your presence. So start the journey at, at that point and then go right through uh, the journey to the end of a, a, a specific transaction. So it could be, for instance, a purchasing transaction or you could um, uh, do it, let's say, a customer complaint transaction, right? That could be a journey too. My customer has a complaint. What's the journey there? Uh, my customer has a request for something. What's the journey there? My customer wants to buy a product. Of course, that's you know that that's a really important uh, journey. But as I say, try and segment it so you're not biting off uh, more than you can chew, and so that the journey map is something that is transparent and, and fairly easy to understand. Uh, also for, for, for management, because that's really important uh, that management also understand what's on the journey map. If you want to see more events like this, make sure to check the upcoming ones at expression.eventbrite.com or check the recordings we've got on this channel. Take care and I will see you around.